right, we're uh, in our last class for this, uh, for this course. Uh, it is the uh, sort of appetizer for the next course, I think, or at least so I'm going to sell it. When we look at uh, Lewis's sci-fi trilogy uh, and also look at Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, as works of fiction that uh, I believe are confronting and uh, to some degree repudiating the uh, premises of the fiction of the 20th century, <coughs> which is, tends to be reductionistic and cynical, uh, just like we see in the human sciences, uh, this flattening effect of life that reduces all of what used to be seen as our highest endeavors and highest uh, longings, the desires we have for beauty and goodness and truth uh, being attributed to the basest instincts, uh, whether they are, be lust or greed or domination, uh, which you will know from Tolkien's Rings of Power, uh, Lord of the Rings is the motif that we find uh, present there. There is a tendency throughout the 20th century through the application of technology and science to see the world in a very flat way and it's not overcome by CGI or extraordinary uh, technological devices that allow us to see uh, through things like the Palantir the seeing stones, uh, the, whether you're watching in, on Zoom or uh, seeing people on the other side of the planet and conversing with them. It's a very uh, disorienting thing. You're seeing somebody on a flat screen who is a three-dimensional person uh, and, trans and transcending space and time to some degree through that time in the sense that somebody 12 hours away in Australia is pre present to you right in your time zone and vice versa. So you get, you get around the space and time. So there's something miraculous about that, but it, there's also a reduction of the person that's on the screen. Anybody who has uh, had to suffer learning through online, uh, which we all did the last couple of years, uh, found there were advantages to it, but also there was something that was lost in the process. <coughs> and it's a good analogy for what Lewis is describing as the flattening effect of modern thought. And uh, I came at that on the course through uh, introducing us through the abolition of man and the, its effect on education and uh, the way in which modern education flattens everything and reduces it to the same basic experience and, and debunks things like beauty and sublimity as merely species are of the same thing, really, and just expressions of our subjective preferences but not having any objective value. And uh, Lewis teased that out and said, if that's true, then everything that has been seen as central to the educational enterprise throughout human history uh, is lost in the process. We lose justice, uh, we lose patriotism, we lose, we lose, uh, we lose God. That, that's there. And he categorized that and portrayed it in a different way in his scholarship. So in the discarded image, he uh, portrayed to us the medieval model. And I, so I began with that. I, last class I talked about why I began with literary criticism rather than the, the fiction or the apologetics in, in some sense because it's harder but in another sense because it really fleshes out what the alternative to a flat way of looking at life is. Uh, and that is the medieval model. It, it's not flat at all. It's rich and complex and entirely rational, however, and interconnected. And uh, in the discarded image, I have here. Um, he celebrates that that model, which he says is is has a combined splendor and sobriety and coherence, uh, 
which he much prefers to the, the evolutionary or developmental model, which is our model. And what he tries to do, however, and he says this at the end of this book, he says the problem with the old medieval model is that it's not true. <laughs> it's just, just, just a little problem. Um, in the sense that that cosmology is not true. And many of the things that are referred to in that uh, go with that exploded ast astronomical model. However, there are truths that are held within that model that he wants to hold on to. And how does he do that? Well, I think he does it through his, his literary endeavors, but even through his apologetics, when he's trying to push us to acknowledge uh, what he calls in the one essay that I've asked you to read, The Weight of Glory, and in another, at least as important, uh, but a little bit more challenging, that essay, Transposition. He tries to transpose uh, the medieval model into uh, terms that will be amenable to uh, the world as we understand it through contemporary science. But in, in the discarded image, he shows the shift from a, a vertical hierarchy uh, to a horizontal progression, because that's the way we see it now in terms of progression, but also it's very flat, horizontal. And we move from a cosmology in which it was axiomatic that all uh, perfect things precede all imperfect things. So the perfect precedes the imperfect. Whereas now we see it the other way around, that the starting point of everything is always lower than what comes out of it. And so, and hence evolution. The lower creatures give way uh, over, over time, over development to higher creatures. And, and thus, mankind only comes at the end of a scale that began back in the, in the muck with the amoeba and then to higher and higher forms of life to the point where we now. So that sort of developmental model, which goes from the lowest to the highest, superseded the medieval and ancient model, which was the other way around. That it, it's to be seen from the top down, not from the bottom up. And how is he going to do that? But he notes this one thing, that there's been a transposition there already in modern thought. And I'm just going to read from the uh, epilogue to the discarded image. He says this, the change of models did not involve astronomy alone. It involved also in biology the change, arguably more important from a, from a devolutionary to an evolutionary scheme. From a cosmology in which it was axiomatic that all perfect things precede all imperfect things, to one in which it is axiomatic uh, that the starting point, or Entwicklungsgrund, is always lower than that what is developed. The degree of change can be gauged by the fact that primitive is now, in most contexts, a pejorative term. Whereas we used to talk about the primitive church and talk about the pure, the purity of the primitive church. You hear this in Christian circles to some degree. They talk about the primitive church. What they mean is the, the church and its early origins and its best expression before it devolves. Whereas now is the word primitive, we think of, you know, as I say, savages or people walking around and acting abominably. And he says that this revolu revolution was certainly not brought about by the discovery of new facts. When I was a boy, Lewis says, I believe that Darwin discovered evolution and that the far more general radical and even cosmic developmentalism, which till lately dominated all popular thought was a superstructure raised on the biological theorem. This view has been sufficiently disproved. That, by the way, that view is still the popular view to this day. And the fact that it's been disproved, nobody seems to acknowledge. But I, as a scholar of the 19th, 18th century, can tell you that uh, Darwin's thought is to be found in, in in Schelling, as he says, in Keats, in Goethe, and in Herder. These are German writers in the mid-18th century. They all talk in terms uh, that you can, are, are in keeping with uh, evolutionism before the biological theory comes along. So that the, the pattern of thought 
is already there. So he says there's no question of the old models being shattered by the inrush of new phenomena. The truth would seem the reverse, that when changes in the human mind produce a sufficient disrelish of the old model and a sufficient hankering for some new one, phenomena to support that new one will obediently turn up. In other words, the facts will fit the presuppositions that we have already. So the facts come to prove a theory that we already want to believe. It's called confirmation bias. So Darwinian, it's called in some circles confirmation bias. We fit the fact to a desire for a different way of looking at things, which we already hold, and then interpret everything to fit that, and then the facts that don't fit it, we just discount those. And then we call it science. <laughs> Until a new scientific theory comes along, and if the old model is sufficiently distasteful, we may abandon that for the new facts which fit better to that. Scientists don't like to acknowledge this, but he says, that that is the case, and that I just find this very interesting. And what he also says is that we can no longer dismiss the change of models as a simple progress from error to truth. No model is a catalog of ultimate realities, and none is a mere fantasies. Each is a serious attempt to get in all the phenomena known at a given period and each succeeds in getting in a great many. But also, no less surely, each reflects the prevalent psychology of an age almost as much as it reflects the state of that age's knowledge. Hardly any battery of new facts would have persuaded a Greek that the universe had an attribute so repugnant to him, to him as infinity. Hardly any such battery could persuade a modern that it is hierarchical. But Lewis believes that it's hierarchical, and that's his challenge. He believes that there is God. He believes that there is a heaven. And in the weight of glory, and in, uh, he is going to express and give us an argument from desire, a so-called argument from desire, for which there is ample evidence. And there's no uh, explanation for the desire that's in him and which we experience, he says, ever so fleetingly a desire, and, and it's present, presented in our fiction, the longing for an Eden, or the longing for a paradise, which we find in major religions also, but also in, in fiction, or for a happy ending, even though life doesn't end in happy endings very often. But it's in stories all the time. How come? Is it just uh, deceit or self-deceit on our part? Are we just... Uh, sating the, the suffering that comes with life with uh, some sort of delusion that distracts us for a time and allows us to escape reality. That's what they call it. It's fiction is escaping reality. People who genuinely have experienced a, a wonderful work of art, uh, a song or a film or a great literary work, um, well, sense there's something a little bit more there, and that's what Lewis is pointing at. And so he comes at this issue uh, throughout his scholarship, and that's what I'm going to talk about today in relation to these two essays, The Weight of Glory and Transposition. <coughs> and he begins by simply noting that, and this is a broad, broad discussion here, not just re related to these two essays, but the two essays, I, I think, uh, point us towards something that's true of his scholarship across the board, and his fiction across the board. And that is the attempt to uh, see the higher spiritual matters at all times. And one of the ways in which he do, does it is through this, what I have here on the screen, which is the attempt in art to depict three dimensions on a flat canvas. That's not a three-dimensional portrait. You can see three dimensions there clearly, right? But the canvas is flat. In this case, the screen is flat on which it's portrayed. And you, and you do it through means of perspective. Right? It's, a, it's a technique. 
And we experience reality in that three-dimensional form. We have bodies. But when we come to paint or draw or conceptualize, we can often, uh, we, we end up reducing or transposing downwards into two dimensions and we try to capture it through, through sort of tricks that involve a third dimension. And you can talk about it mathematically and so forth, and you end up having to use symbolism to do that, the forms of algebra. Right? To describe uh, the fact that uh, we only don't experience things only in two dimensions, but, but in three. And the tendency of modern science is to flatten that down into a mathematical form and to get rid of the symbolism even because the symbolism will suggest that there might be something more in there. So Lewis is going to transpose in the other direction, and that's what he's writing about in these two essays, and which I think he's trying to do in his fiction. He's going to start with a model that assumes the highest form of being, and then will show the lower forms in relation to it, rather than reducing and eliminating it from the outset as his presupposition, which is what uh, modern fiction does. And in this, he shares a common tendency with others of the, I've mentioned this book already, uh, The Year of Our Lord, 1943, Christian Human, Humanism in the Age of Crisis. Uh, he shares this tendency along with uh, several others of the same era. They see the common problem. Jacques Maritain is one of them, along with Tolkien uh, and others. But he, he uh, notes here that um, in order to uh, do that, he needs to uh, acknowledge the fact that everything has been flattened down. And that's the tendency of modern education as well, is to flatten everything down uh, that is the most admirable and attribute it to something that is lower. But then we, uh, as he says at the end of The Abolition of Man, or at least the first chapter, uh, we want to we want a, uh, we make geldings then ask, to be fruit, ask them to be fruitful and multiply. So we demand the function without the equipment to do it anymore. We want virtues from our children, but we've already eliminated the very possibility of virtue because vir virtue is not something that you can pin down and observe in front of you any more than justice is or beauty. We've already re reduced it to uh, a sort of species of what I called epiphenomenology. So we call it beauty, but really it's just a biochemical reaction which leads to a, what do they call it these days? Uh, the uh, brain chemistry, that uh, brain chemical dopamine gives you a little bit of feeling of pleasure which we associate with something higher, but that something higher doesn't actually exist. It, it's because of the brain chemistry going on beneath. So everything gets reduced down to that, and that includes the hum human nature gets reduced to a brain. Another form of that same flattening or reductionism. Lewis comes at this in various ways, and he draws on different sources. Let me just say something about this. In his own writing, uh, because part of my work uh, here in the classroom is to push you to look at his sources that lead him to his conclusion. And one of them is the critique of positivism that emerges in the 19th century. Um, chiefly, uh, Henri Bergson. I haven't mentioned him very often, but Bergson, B-E-R-G-S-O-N. Uh, he is a critic of the positivism of his day, which is just the flattening. Everything gets reduced cynically to material objects. Bergson says, no, there's something there, in, even in the material, which transcends that reductionistic tendency, and he talks about it as the élan vital, the, 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 a, a life force. There's a power which he attributes to the organic. There's life, there's genuine vitality in organisms that is not just a biochemical thing. There's something that mo moves these things and, and animates them, activates them. So he's a critic of the 
base reductionism of the 18th and 19th centuries, including Darwinian evolution, that there's a life and a power behind this. The problem with Bergson is that he uh, still th see things in, in broadly speaking, uh, two dimensions. There's the material and then there's the organic. But he doesn't acknowledge the spiritual as a third dimension. And that's where intellectuals like, uh, like Lewis and Tolkien and Jacques Maritain uh, come in. Uh, they show the, uh, that the organic is insufficient in itself. It, it ends up having us worship nature as in, in the same way that Lewis describes the pantheists as doing. Remember at, the, at book two, he talks about pantheism, and that makes good and evil effectively the same source. So the power which we want to say is uh, there with justice will also be found in injustice, and we can't differentiate them. Good and evil have this, are the, they, they, there's a power or a vitality there. We worship the power, but we can't say that this is a bad uh, expression of power, and this is a good one. It just depends on your perspective then. So good and evil collapse with this. We have to appeal to a higher category and a spiritual one at that in order to do otherwise. So your theology does matter. Then you do need to begin with something higher, namely God. That's what he does in mere Christianity. It's not enough to appeal to, to power itself. It's not enough to appeal to uh, love either because you could reduce love just to lust or to material comfort, familiarity, or some sort of evolutionary motivation. Like friendship is there because it helps me get more food. Right, so it's got, it serves a, a, a lower purpose, a selfish one. It's not, and the problem for the evolutionist on this is, well, what happens when somebody lays down his life for for others, what's the evolutionary benefit to the person who gives up his life? And they, it, you can watch them contort themselves in knots at that point. But uh, Lewis and uh, and Tolkien and Maritain and Charles Peggy and others will critique even Bergson's uh, vitalism. As much as they find the vitalism is useful, they'll say that ultimately, just the striving or the will to power, as Nietzsche calls it, is insufficient to defeat materialism. You need more than that. And I remember last time, I, I, the recording cut out, but I showed the Ubermensch and the Untermensch. Effectively, both of them are striving, and what, Bert, what, what Nietzsche will say is that the Ubermensch ought to get rid of the slave mentality of the Untermensch. Cut those weaklings loose. Start trampling them under your feet. Stop treating them as if they're the same as you. They don't have the same will to power. You need to, for the sake of the, the, the species of which you are the, now the, the evolved form, move on from them. And we can, you can see the horrors of the 20th century open up with that idea in, in uh, Nazi Fascism, you can even see it in communism as well. You can dispense with uh, millions of individuals as long as the group survives. Individual life matters not. It doesn't bear the image of God. There's no accountability to God. They're, all, they're both atheist, right? Because there's no God in either system. That's the, that's, so that's the first way is he, he, he pulls in uh, the the vitalism of uh, Bergson, but then finds it wanting. It says, no, we need a third dimension here. And to acknowledge that there is a third dimension, in fact, we know that there's a third dimension. Even if we tend to reduce things to a second dimension, there's something in us that finds that dissatisfactory. People who have been in love are not going to be satisfied with the explanation that really is just a form of lust that they have gussied up with some nice poetry and a little bit of music to get the outcome that they want. No, there's more than that. And he, he will then go, and this I'll spend more time on this next semester, 
He will appeal to something that arises in the mid-19th century in mathematics, the idea of, of a fourth dimension even, hyperspace, and a form of being that transcends even a three-dimensional being. We have three-dimensional being, right? We can think of things in that terms. We don't just look at each other flat. You have to portray it on a canvas in flat terms, but you can see people on a screen, it's also flat. But in person, it's three-dimensional. If we can do that, but we can't paint it, what would it be like to consider a person, a divine person who had a dimension that we can vaguely conceptualize as a possibility, but not yet experience? Well, that's what God is like. So it's this idea of a fourth dimension and the idea of the divine personhood when he's talking about the Trinity back in Mere Christianity chapter, or, uh, book four. So he says this on the, so this is the God dimension. Uh, Mere Christianity, book four, chapter two, he says, on the human level, one person is one being and any two persons are two separate beings, just as in two dimensions, say on a flat sheet of paper, one square is one figure and any two squares are two separate figures, on the divine level, you s still find personalities, but up there you find them combined in new ways which we, who do not live on that level, cannot imagine. In God's dimension, so to speak, you find a being who is three persons while remaining one being. Just as a cube is six squares while remaining one cube. Of course, we cannot fully conceive a being like that, just as if we were so made that we perceived only two dimensions in space, we could never properly imagine a cube. But we can get a sort of faint notion of it. And when we do, we are then, for the first time in our lives, getting some positive idea, however faint, of something super personal, something more than a person. So it's an analogy he's drawing to help us to understand when we're speaking of the Trinity and thereby of a higher dimension in which we experience from down below. But we need to see it from the top down, not from the bottom up. We can't just project upwards, we need to also project downwards. That's the whole attempt of his, his fiction is to do this. That's what Narnia is about. Even the Narnia, remember they go through, they go, the first uh, experience is going through the wardrobe and then they go into this imaginary world. They only, don't only go through a wardrobe, they, come, they go through a picture frame, they come through other means into that world. And it's a transposition into a world. But then they find that all of those transpositions of this world, this fictional world of Narnia, or at least it's called fictional, by the Eustace Scrubs and others of the world that they lived in, are actually just faint analogies of the real Narnia. And they call, they're called upon to go further up and further in, but further up. And so there's a, Lewis is trying to convey that the real thing is up and above in the same way that we see it in, depicted in the discarded image, the way he describes the Ptolemaic cosmology. Heaven is up there and we are outside of it. And it's the inside rather than thinking of that as outer space we're on the outside looking in while we're looking up. So that's why it's further up, but also further in. We're, the out, we're outside of it. So he's trying to invert the spatial temporal worldview of the developmental model, which calls that outer space. In which case, if that's the case, this is the real and that is the nothing. There's nothing and if God is, just said to be in heaven and heaven is in the spatial uh, outer spaces in the nothingness then he's just a projection of our imagination of course he debunked God that but he says that it's not only God that goes with it our, all of our ideas of goodness and justice and beauty and truth go along with it because they also are not to be found in the material in the, in the flat perspective of modern education and yet his whole uh, endeavor is to demonstrate that not only are those things real, they are necessary in a way that the flat things are not. And the best exponents of this, interestingly, are not theologians in the 20th century, they are artists. Uh, Lewis and Tolkien, I, I think, are the foremost uh, 
and the best exponents of showing a new way, a, a different way of looking at life, which interestingly happens to come from two medievalists by profession. And why is that? Because they've been able to see through the lens of a different worldview than the one that is fashionable in their own day, and they can see that the one in their own day is fashionable. That's all it is. It's not any more real or any more true than the old model was. It just fits certain tastes. It's the taste of our age to debunk the idea of something better, higher, more beautiful, more just. Heaven, the, the place full of the weight of glory. And that's what this, that great essay, The Weight of Glory, is about. So what Lewis tries to do, and I think he, he, what he does in his fiction, and I think in his apologetics, and even to some degree, although this is not the, uh, I don't think this is the intention, but it may be the effect of his scholarship, is he tries to put into practice what we read about in this little essay called Transposition. Transposition is, uh, in music, you put something, take something in one key and then you transpose it into another, right? It's the same thing, but in and out. And the question is, do we transpose the uh, higher in terms of the lower, which is the contemporary fashion and taste, or do we do it the other way around? And Lewis and Tolkien both try and do it the other way around, I'm going to submit. That's, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to transpose higher things in terms of the lower in accordance with, as I say, what uh, Lewis describes as the tendency of the way things used to be seen. I'll quote exactly here. All perfect things precede all imperfect things rather than the other way around. So look at, let's have the idea of perfection preceding all of these things. So if you look at Tolkien's work, look at the Silmarillion and the depiction of the beginning of things where Iluvatar sings the cosmos into being. Right? And then there's a note of discord. Same presentation in different form, obviously, in Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he saw that it was good. Very good repeats it. Good, 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 good. And then there's a fall from that goodness. But it starts with perfection, and then it moves towards imperfection or corruption. That's the vision that they want to present. So the past and even the present is, is, is shot full of a goodness and a glory and a holiness that is not to be flattened down or reduced, even though there's attempts made to do exactly that by the characters that we call evil, including the educators. The educators also want to reduce the idea of God to fiction. And he shows the outcome of that, the nefarious outcome of that, in the discarded, or rather in the abolition of man. When he actually comes to the abolition of man, we end up being uh, the beneficiaries of a power over nature, which is actually not a power over nature at all. It's a power we deliver up to certain scientists who use power for the benefit not of all, but for some, and it ends up being for them. So the, the uh, transposition here uh, assumes a three-level hierarchy and, and, and talks about the complexities that go with that. And, he, uh, and those things lead to the reductive tendencies of modern thought. And the context for that, by the way, is the uh, Feast of Pentecost. He's delivering this as a sermon. Interesting. Just like the weight of glory, this is another sermon. Quite the sermon. But I think it's more than a sermon. It is a principle of his whole apologetic intent and also of his fiction. He wants to depict a, a transposition of the way we look at the world and flip it around. 
so he starts with the glossolalia. I'm going to talk about here about transposition. The glossa or the speaking in tongues. And he relates it to other phenomena in the Christian life, taking bread and wine, or the expectation of a bodily resurrection which involve, as he says, not only the manifestation of the supernatural in the natural, that's what happened, take, eat, this is my body. In what sense is this Christ's body? But that's, exa that's exactly the language. It's used in churches to this day. They don't, somebody may say, uh, to clarify, it's, it's, it's a symbol. But the word symbol <laughs> is inadequate for exactly what's being described here. Just in case you thought that I thought the bread and wine was, was, was an actual body in front of you. Well, no, I didn't think that. I, I knew that it was bread and wine. So, yes, okay, thanks for explaining that it's a symbol. Yeah, I sort of got that. You know? The kid, the, the, the two-year-olds got that as well. Right? That you didn't, I didn't need the explanation. Okay, but it's a symbol, yes. But there's more than that, and you mean more than that. And you know that. And we know that when Jesus says to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body, they know it's not him. <laughs> but it, in a sense, it is him. So what, in what sense is it him? It's a symbolic sense, but symbolic in a very rich way that there's no other way of describing it. It's, it's transposition. He's trying to describe in terms of two dimensions what's actually three-dimensional. In what sense does God make some, himself present in bread and wine? We know that he does because he says it himself even when Christ distributes his, the bread and wine to the disciples, he, that's exactly what he's saying. Take, eat, this is my body. Right? And Paul says, uh, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim uh, the Lord Jesus until he comes. There's some sense. On the Emmaus Road, uh, the disciples are disheartened because, uh, and they confront Jesus along the road and they don't recognize him and he asks them why they're disheartened and they say, well, you know, we were following this Jesus and he got crucified, it was terrible. What a terrible time it was and then Jesus rebukes them, reminds them all these things had to happen and he predicted that they would happen and then he breaks the bread with them and then their eyes are open and they see him and, he, and then he disappears, then he disappears. Interesting, right? Only then. When their eyes are open, then they don't see him anymore. What? That's a strange passage. It's not they see who he is finally. It's only at that point they realize that he was there. And he said, and then they say, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the Emmaus Road? That they, in, in hindsight, in reflection, they knew something more was happening there, which they now see only again in retrospection. They didn't see it in the two-dimensional flatness of a man in front of them, or even a three-dimensional, they thought there was another thing there, but, and they knew it, but now they knew more. So that's what's being described. Lewis is trying to present that in his fiction. And he says it's entirely realistic, and not only uh, true, it's entirely realistic to our experience, because everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about here. It's not only Christians that will uh, acknowledge this. Uh, and, and he quotes, in fact, uh, Samuel Pepys, who went to a concert and talked about the fact that he felt uh, moved, but not only moved by what he heard, the music, but he felt sickened. The strange contrast of things, like when you're uh, watching something and laughing and suddenly tears are streaming down your face, you're crying, like there's this odd... Uh, connection there or when you're so upset that you suddenly start laughing hysterically and you've been in that situation really you're laughing why am I laughing I don't know I'm so upset but there's a, there's this and the, the connection of those two things that are have no connection they seem opposite to another that's being depicted in this, the experience so that's what he's trying to capture there there is there's more here than the reductionists are allowing and I want to pierce through that because they are missing the point. So Lewis observes that the very same phenomena which he approaches from above 
as the plane from a higher to a lower or from the richer to the poorer, God to takes on human flesh, what a, like, from the majesty from on high to take on the form of a servant, even the lowest form. I mean, he's born in a manger in a feeding trough of an animal. He doesn't, he can't even find a place to give birth. His mother is having to, and father having to hunt around in the dark can be approached from below. He acknowledges that. From the naturalistic perspective, the higher things can be approached from lower. But he just wants acknowledgement that it can also happen the other way around. Now, how does he depict this? Well, think about how he does it in the fiction. So in uh, The Queen of the Underworld in, in The Silver Chair, she tries to convince the kids, the Narnians, that their recollection of the sun is actually just an extrapolation of the dim lamp that they see all around them. You're just extrapolating. Same with a lion. You just have the idea of a cat and you've made him bigger. It's just analogy on your part from the lower to the higher. And similarly, at the human level, on the, on the frontier where reason and nature meet, the same physical act, act can express either love or lust. Everyone attributes it these days to lust. Watch your films, everything is lust very quickly. And some of them jump to it immediately. Not only is it lust, but it's a perversion of lust, of, of lust and a very uh, dim one like in, in Game of Thrones, where it's not only lust, but it's incest like the very worst forms. Or Fifty Shades of Grey, where love is a sort of a, you know, masochistic. And sadistic. Think about what think people, like what could, what could uh, encourage people to consume a, a, a form of love romance in which a, a man is abusive to a woman. And the women are the ones that are buying the books. It's extraordinary. But it's, again, a form of thinking that sees the higher only in the lower. That's the explanation for it, and is then going to reduce it to psychology, furthermore. So one way of saying this is the appearance of three dimensions is an optical illusion. It's just a series of lines on a paper, and that's true. We're using a per, what is called perspective as a technique to give us the impression of three dimensions on two dimensions. That's true. Another great one by Escher, uh, this famous one. And that is the tendency of our age. The propensity to approach everything from below leads to a predictable conclusion. Everything that is higher is to be explained in terms of the lower. So religion is only psychology. Things that are properly human, uh, thinking, reasoning, uh, our emotions, our volitions, our sense of free will can be reduced down to biochemical responses, lusts. or some sort of psychological causation. So politics is just economics, says Marx. And, and even thinking, as I've said, is just some sort of phenomenology, like cerebral biochemistry. And we, we th associate the good things with dopamine hits. And they can show you your brain lighting up. Have you seen the pictures of a brain being excited by something and it's really firing and you can see all the lights going on, see there, and you associate that and you say, obviously that's a good thing. So you associate that biochemical hit with the experience of God or whatever. So there's a, and, and he says, the very continuity between grades of being that leads from transposition, um, and is always reduced down to lower. It can happen the other way. It can go over the other way around as well. And with greater appeal and rationality. 
and that's all he's doing. So if you can convert it one way, I can do it the other way. And not only can I do it the other way, that is a better explanation for human experience. And just because it's fashionable to ignore that doesn't mean that it's true. I can be unfashionable. And, and look at things from the further up and further in perspective. So this process of upgrading um, is, is characteristic of, of Lewis's thought. I, I said that throughout the whole course. So it's not just that Lewis is a fictional writer of some significance in the 20th century. I think he's a better writer than he's given credit for, precisely because he is capable of portraying this dimension in a way that is perceptible to his audience, and it, it does take a good writer to do this. Uh, but also in the sense that he has a broad appeal across ages, young and old, Tolkien equally so. Uh, great works of literature have a much broader appeal. They don't only appeal to those uh, who are in the uh, corridors of academia, who look down their noses at popular writers. Don't teach them. Don't teach Tolkien, don't teach Lewis. But, but the, uh, their contemporaries are reading Lewis and Tolkien. And what do you do with that? Well, you sort of debunk them in general to say, well, they have no taste, by which they mean they don't have the fashionable taste of the academy. But is the fashionable taste of the academy <laughs> correct? Or is it just the same sort of elite that dismissed Galileo's theories when he proposed them, when they contradicted the medieval model. And I would say that that's the case. It's just, it is a, it, it's the establishment view that this is the wrong way of doing things and people who think this are benighted in some way. Haven't seen things sufficiently, clearly. And if they were just better educated, they would think exactly like they're betters. Now, next semester, when we go to his sci-fi trilogy, I will look exa exactly at that in Paraland in uh, Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra, we'll look at how the, the process of evolution uh, in the hands of the scientists is a way of explaining an encounter with another world, and yet the encounter with the other world reverses all the expectations. They are more intelligent than we are. They are more peaceable, they are more virtuous, and yet they don't look like us. And so there's a sort of a speciesism that he is being, uh, it's fashionable in our day to uh, debunk uh, the idea that people bear the imago day and say, well, that's just speciesism. You're, you're saying that human beings are superior to the animals, that you're just privileging the human. Lewis knows that argument and flips it on its head. Yes, but you're doing exactly the same thing by assuming that you're at the top of the de developmental scale and looking down on everything else. That's, you're doing the exact same thing. And you're portraying it in your fiction. And so he comes out again from, from fictional form. And so he isn't just repudiating the science fiction of his day, he is, he is transfiguring it, or um, yeah, tra transfiguring it. He's upgrading the evolutionary view of nature. There's a nature that is piled on top of a nature. And there's a higher nature. Let's not reduce everything to the nature that we experience uh, as biology or chemistry or physics. There's a higher form of nature which we can imagine, and we can imagine, and here's the evidence of it. We can imagine three dimensions on a two-dimensional page. We can thereby, as three-dimensional beings, also imagine four dimensions, hyperspace, and so forth. So he takes the view, and it's, it's, it's the Augustinian view that uh, 
bad things are simply good things perverted. So there's no such a thing as evil. There's simply the privation of the good, the distortion of the good. And even the developmentalism is not totally evil, but it is a distorted form of the good. You're, not, you're looking at things the wrong way, is the way Lewis is going to describe it. You need to see things from the top down, not from the bottom up. You need to take God's vantage point on, on things, which is the, point, which is the perspective of, the, of uh, the pagans, by the way, as well. They also looked at things from the top down. They recognized that there was something about human nature which is superior, which our contemporaries do as well. They also think that we're at the top of the evolutionary ladder. It's just that they have contempt for the lower things, whereas the old way of thinking did not have contempt for the lower. It just simply acknowledged that it was lower. And it didn't try to flatten the difference and reduce us to that. And so he observes this, that it's clear that what is happening in the lower medium can only be understood if we know the higher medium. We have to know the higher in order to understand the lower even. So three dimensions, we have to have experienced three dimensions to know that this is three dimensional, that the intent is to capture three dimensions on the, on the page there. Right, you have to already have experienced three dimensionality. Likewise, in order to know and to talk about heaven and God, there has to have been something of God's uh, presence experience, however fleetingly, like a lightning, when lightning lights up the sky on a dark night and you see just temporarily a flash and then it's gone, there's, still, there's something there and you can't deny it. It's there. So I'll, I'll read this, he says, the instance where this knowledge is most commonly lacking is the musical one. The piano version means one thing to the musician who knows the original orchestral score and another man thing to the man who merely hears, hears it as a piano piece. But the second man would be at an even greater disadvantage if he had never heard any instrument but piano and even doubted the existence of other instruments. Even more, we understand pictures only because we know and inhabit the three-dimensional world, like this. If we can imagine a creature who perceived only two dimensions and yet could somehow be aware of the lines as he crawled over them on the paper, we shall easily see how impossible it would be for him to understand. And he would think something along the line, you keep on telling me of this other world and its unimaginable shapes, which you call solid. This is what he depicted in uh, The Great Divorce. He goes to a world which he imagined would be less real, less substantial, and he encountered the exact opposite. It was solid, real, hard. It, it, it cut his feet to stand in heaven. That's what he's trying to depict there. And he says it's of some importance to note that the word symbolism, we're talking about a symbolism of, let's say, the body and blood of Christ, is not adequate in all cases to cover the relations between the higher medium and its transposition in the lower. In some cases it does it perfectly, but not others. So thus the relation between speech and writing is one of symbolism. What's the relation between the written word and the spoken word? And what's the relation between the spoken word, the written word? And even think about this, when I am using a word and I have the word in my mind and I articulate it through the means of my tongue and it goes from my tongue and the vibrations in the air hits your ear and you translate it into, uh, on the back of your brain, you, you hear it and you understand the word as I have articulated. How does that process work? It's through transposition. And he talks about the nature, Augustine talks about the, the word being at the one time uh, separate from God and at the same time one with God. It's a way of understanding something that almost defies our understanding and yet we experience all the time. My words went in your ears, they went into your brain and then you could write it down. How is that even possible? It's an extraordinary thing. We experience a spiritual reality all the time. The written characters, characters exist solely for the eye, 
the spoken words solely for the ear, and yet we transpose them all the time. They are not like one another, nor does the one cause the other to be. So we can't just flatten them down. The written words does not precede the spoken word, or vice versa, in our experience there. They're different. The one is simply a sign of the other and signifies it by a convention. But a picture is not related to the visible world in just that way. Pictures are part of the visible world themselves and represent it only by being part of it. Their visibility has the same source. The suns and lamps in pictures seem to shine only because real suns or lamps shine on them. So you can't see the picture if I turn the lights out. You can this one because it's being cast by a light, but it, an actual picture, if I turned all the lights, you can't see that. You need a light in the room to see the light depicted on the page, which is the sun. So the sunlight in a picture is therefore not related to real sunlight simply as written words are to spoken. It is a sign, but also something more than a sign. And only a sign because it is also more than a sign, because in it the thing signified is really in certain in a certain mode, present. If I had to name the relation, I should call it not symbolical, but sacramental. There he goes. And the word sacrament in Greek means mysterium. The Latin word sacramentum is the Greek word mysterium. It's mysterious. Saying something that we can't quite put our finger on, and yet it's there. But in the case we started from of emotion and sensation, we are even further beyond mere symbolism, for there, as we have seen, the very same sensation does not merely accompany nor merely signify diverse and opposite emotions, but becomes part of them. And, 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 and thereby it can be perceived as agony or delight. And uh, this is noticed in the 18th century aesthetics, uh, that extreme pain, when you alleviate the pain, there's something like the experience of pleasure. The removal of the pain is a pleasurable experience. And likewise, too much pleasure, like when you tickle somebody, they are in pain, they're in agony. Stop, some people are really ticklish, right? And they're, they are to tortured by this. I'm not going to maintain, says Lewis, that what I call transposition is the only possible mode whereby a poorer medium can respond to a richer, but I claim that it is very hard to imagine any other. It is at the very least, not improbably, that transposition occurs whenever the higher reproduces itself in the lower. Thus, to digress for a moment, it seems to me very likely that the real relation between mind and body is one of transposition. Think about it in terms of what I just talked about the word, the, the sound of the word, which you then write down, transposition. And what is that capturing but a mental image? Right, it's not just the word, it's, it's a concept. And the concept is what? It's, a, it's a, a rational thing, captured in sensible form, either written down where you can see it or in oral form where you can, oral form where you can hear it. We are certain that in this life, at any rate, thought is intimately connected with the brain. The theory that thought, therefore, is merely a movement in the brain is, in my opinion, nonsense. For if so, that theory itself would be merely a movement and an event among atoms which may have speed and direction, but of which it would be meaningless to use the words true or false. We are that driven then to some kind of correspondence. But if we assume one for one correspondence, this means that we have a have to attribute an almost unbelievable complexity and variety of events to the brain. Well, that is what's going on right now in modern psychology. Everything is down to the brain. But I submit that a one-for-one -one relation is probably quite unnecessary. All our examples suggest that the brain can respond in 
in a sense adequately and exquisitely correspond to the seemingly infinite variety of consciousness without providing one single physical modification for each single modification of consciousness. But this is a digression. Feel a page on. Everything is different when you approach the transposition from above. As we all do in the case of emotion and sensation or of the three-dimensional world and pictures. And as the spiritual man does in the case we are considering. He began with glossolalia, speaking in tongues. Those who spoke with tongues, as St. Paul did, can well understand how that holy phenomenon differed from the hysterical phenomenon, though it be remembered, they were in a sense exactly the same phenomenon. So they heard blah, 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 the glossolalia, right? Except they heard that because that's what a foreign language sounds like. Or you hear noises, noises, articulate sounds, but you don't understand them. And yet the hearers did understand them in their own language. Though be remembered, they were in a sense exactly the same phenomena, just as the very same sensations came to peeps in love and the enjoyment of music and in sickness. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man judges all things and is judged of none. I believe this doctrine of transposition, Lewis says, provides for most of a ba us a background very much needed for the theological virtue of hope. We can hope only for what we can desire. And the trouble is that any adult and philosophically respectable notion we can form of heaven is forced to deny of that state most of the things our nature desires. A man does not become as a little child by aping childhood. I've seen this in churches, by the way. <laughs> Just become as little children, so they all act like infantile, more or less. And there's something called primal scream therapy. Have you ever seen this? People have uh, traumas in life, and they, they get them to curl up in a ball and wail and scream at the moment the trauma took place. No, it's a way of going back to that early experience and undoing it. All right. Hence, our notion of heaven involves perpetual negations, no food, no drink, no sex, no movement, no mirth, no, ab no events, no time, no art. But there is a positive way of enjoying God, and this is what Lewis is transposing us towards. It's a positive vision. So he doesn't, he, he, he adopts the cataphatic way. It's a comprehensible, it's a rational faith. Let me go back to the weight of glory. Because I think it's a it's maybe his best essay. But the transposition is the is the one that best explains what he does in his own uh, fiction and does in his apologetics. He's not just confronting, he's transposing. I think it's a sort of a key to see what he's trying to do, what what Di what differentiates Lewis from the philosophers that study him is that he has the capacity to transpose, and they don't. They, ad they adopt the same rational approach, which is reductionistic, as he does. They just simply say, well, you're leaving something out, and I'm going to refute you logically. That's only part of the endeavor. There needs to be more than that to uh, grasp what Lewis is doing there. But he says that uh, in the weight of glory, that uh, he uses the analogy of life being something like, Augustine says this as well in De Doctrina Christiana, being like on a journey. A journey towards, well, it's a journey towards heaven. And what you need to do along the journey is to uh, hold on to what is good and, and learn to reject what is not. But it, it's, a, it's a process, and to some degree you don't, immediately see everything you need to see. So here he appeals to the idea of learning Greek poetry. He says, uh, 
uh, Greek poetry is a very difficult thing to enjoy because you have to learn Greek, <laughs> first of all. And the learning of Greek is not particularly enjoyable. You have to learn a different script. You have to learn different words. You have to learn the grammar that holds it together. And then you start reading the Greek poetry, and even then it's a foreign language, and it takes time. So the, the actual act, which ultimately will be enjoying the poetry, it is a long, slow, and painful process, best inflicted on the young. Because they can't say no, you have to, they're gonna do it because you force them to do it. No, that's not the real reason. The real reason is they pick up grammar quickly and words quickly, really easily at that age. And they're just sort of going, and they like memorization. So you do foreign languages and so forth when you're really young because you pick them up quick, 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 and almost by osmosis. And then you finally, when they get to the point where they can start to say, heck no, I'm not doing that. They now are able to do it, and now they want to do it. But you have to get it to the point before they can say no. Same with learning a musical instrument, by the way. It's hard to do it when you're an adult because it's too painful. It's too repetitive, it's too dull, it's too uh, slow. It takes a long, it's a long, slow march in the same direction. But if you do it when they're young enough and you do it, rep it gets to the point by the time they're at the age where you could say, I would prefer not to do it, now you're doing it in a way that you appreciate the beauty and the goodness in it and now you want to do it. Same thing with Greek, he says, uh, an enjoyment of Greek poetry is certainly a proper and not a mercenary reward for learning Greek. In the same way he's just said that marriage is the proper reward for a real lover and he is not mercenary for desiring it. In the same way heaven is something that we should desire. And it's called a reward. And some people think that we're being um, selfish in talking about wanting to be in heaven and wanting heaven to be there. So he, he wants to confront that idea. He says that it's good and proper to want to be in heaven because God resides there. So we should want that. It's not wrong to want that. But there's an aspect of this along the way in which, uh, like Greek poetry, um, it, you can only uh, appreciate it after you've gone through the long, arduous process of being able to appreciate it. So he says the schoolboy learning Greek grammar cannot look forward to his adult enjoyment of Sophocles. As a lover looks forward to marriage, or a general to victory, he has to begin by working for Marx, or to escape punishment, or to please his parents, or at best in the hope of a future good which he cannot at present imagine or desire. And he says that this is the situation of the Christian towards heaven. You're doing it for the wrong reasons to some degree. And yet, it the habits that you're forming are working you towards uh, the real thing. So his position is somewhat mercenary, the kid is. The reward he's going to get will be a natural and proper reward, but he will not know that till he has got it. Of course, he gets it gradually. Enjoyment creeps in upon the mere drudgery, and nobody could point to a day or an hour when the one ceased and the other began. But it is just insofar as he approaches the reward that he becomes able to desire it for its own sake. So that's the point. You have to make yourself fit for heaven. You have to want. You have to go along. There's a certain process along the way. And the power of desiring it is a preliminary award. So the Christian in relation to heaven is as much in the same position as this schoolboy. Those who have attained everlasting life in the vision of God doubtless know very well that it is no mere bribe, but the very consummation of their earthly discipleship but we who have not yet attained it cannot know this in the same way and cannot even begin to know it at all except by continuing to obey and finding the first reward of our obedience in our increasing power to desire the ultimate reward. Just in proportion as the desire grows, our fear lest it should be a mercenary desire will, will die away and finally be recognized as an absurdity. So there's a process along the way. At first you do it out of duty. That's what children do. They obey their parents. If, you're, if they're in a Christian family, children obey their parents. It's not adults will say, well, they don't have faith yet. No, they don't. They have obedience. 
and they don't have faith in the sense that they don't desire it. They're doing it because mom and dad want them to do it or whatever. It's what the group is doing. We're doing it for that reason. But long enough exposure creates in them a desire that was not there initially, is what he's saying. And, th and I'm applying it to children. This is true of adults as well. So the obedience actually transforms or transposes into the higher thing. And he says, now, if we are made for heaven, the desire for our proper place will be already in us, but not yet attached to the true object and will even appear as the rival of that object. So this is why he will, what he will explain, and he already has explained in relation to uh, Eros, Venus, loves. The loves of this world remind us of true love. And they can even deceive us. And if they deceive us, then they eventually become abusive and, uh, and, uh, and corrupt, and they become rivals to that. So we adore and become addicts to some pleasure, which we worship rather than the thing that it points to. And he says that this is true of all of life. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them it was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. So a good book awakens that longing that is outside the book and above the book. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself, they are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. Do you think I'm trying to weave a spell? Perhaps I am, but remember your fairy spells, spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. Think of the, uh, the witch in Underland in the silver chair. So this is an enchantment. Yes, it is. What am I trying to break? The, what, what enchantment am I trying to break? The enchantment of developmentalism, that everything's to be explicable in terms of the lower. I'm trying to break that enchantment. He's, he's explicit about it. You and I need the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness, which has been laid upon us for nearly 100 years. There he goes. Since the mid-19th century. Almost our whole education has been directed to silencing this shy, persistent inner voice. Almost all our modern philosophies have been devised to convince us that the good of man is to be found on this earth. And yet it is a remarkable thing that such philosophies of progress or creative evolution themselves bear reluctant witness to the truth that our real goal is elsewhere. When they want to convince you that earth is your home, notice how they said about it, they begin by trying to persuade you that the earth can be made into heaven, thus giving a sop to your sense of exile on earth as it is. So they have to appeal to the very thing which they deny exists to make you want to reduce everything to that. So they present it to you and they take it away. That doesn't exist, but it will exist here. Next, they will tell you that this fortunate event is still a good way off in the future, thus giving a sop to your knowledge that the fatherland is not here and now. Finally, lest your longing for the trans-temporal should awake and spoil the whole affair, they use any rhetoric that comes to hand to keep you out of your mind the recollection that even if all the happiness they promised could come to man on earth, yet still each generation would lose it by death, including the last generation of all, and the whole story would be nothing, not even a story, forever and ever. Hence all the nonsense that Mr. Shaw puts in the final speech of Lilith and Bergson's remark that the Elam Vital is capable of surmounting all obstacles, perhaps even death, as if we could believe any social or biological development on this planet will delay the senility of the sun or reverse the second law of thermodynamics. So there is a desire that no natural happiness will satisfy. That's the weight of glory. It's the sense of heaven in our midst. That's what Lewis most decidedly points to it. This is why I think Lewis is a great writer. 
uh, as I say, well, next semester I'm done for today. Next semester I will pick it up with uh, his science fiction trilogy. Well, actually, I'll start by looking at uh, science fiction uh, in forms that are that won't acknowledge the higher just to see the backdrop against which he writes. I think we'll look at Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we'll look at uh, First Men in the Moon by H.G. Wells. And you, you can see the way in which the cosmos is portrayed, outer space, the horror, and so forth, and then see Lewis's response to that. I think it's quite helpful. Anyway, hopefully see you next time. <laughs>